Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to this 20th session of Discovering Islam. Um, we have been talking about different topics which are important for understanding what the message of Islam is. Uh, in the recent few sessions, we started our discussion on the different elements of faith, belief. We have already talked about belief in God and belief in the life hereafter. Uh, from today on, I'm going to begin a discussion on belief in prophets. The first thing, who is a prophet? The Almighty, our creator, in order for informing humans about his plan for this life, chose a few individuals to let them have his message, which they would in turn, uh, let others know about. These individuals are called Ambiya. The singular is Nabi. We normally translate them in English with this word, but with the word prophet. There is another expression which is Rasul, the plural of which is Rasul, and normally messenger is the English ex expression which is used to translate a Rasul. So, prophets, when they come to this world, particularly to a society where they invite others to believe in and accept the message that they are presenting, claiming it to be from God, need to be believed in. In other words, their message is to be accepted. Um, and I'll talk about why. But let me clarify that these two different words used for the representatives of the Almighty in this world, uh, Rasul and Nabi, uh, what exactly is the difference? The expression Nabi, prophet, is a general expression. Whoever was chosen by the Almighty for the purpose of him to be delivered the message of the Almighty uh, for onward communication to others is a prophet. From amongst the prophets, Ambiya, there were some who were given the status of Rasul as well. They, that is the Rasul, were the prophets who, when they would come to their nation, they would address them and let them know from day one that we have come to let you know about God's plan, His scheme. And we are telling you that if you are going to reject this message, then you, my immediate addressees, you are going to be punished and destroyed in this very life, before the next life. All other evil people are going to be punished in the next life. But in your case, the punishment is going to arrive in this life. So all the prophets who make this very clear statement to their nations, uh, they were called Rasul. So all Rasul are prophets as well. But all prophets are not necessarily Rasul. So Rasul is a subset of prophet. Is it necessary to believe in prophets and Rasul? Well, the answer is yes. Because they are the representatives of our creator. They bring the message of the Almighty. That message has to be accepted, acknowledged, respected, followed. And therefore, if you receive the message and you begin to realize that it's from your creator, what other choice do you have? Except the fact that you say that it's from my creator and therefore I've got to accept it. Uh, what are the consequences of not believing? Well, that is a difficult question to answer because, because it would depend on what your situation is. 
if there are individuals who are living at the time when the prophets are there themselves physically present and communicating the message, then if somebody says no, not immediately, but after a certain deadline is reached, such people are declared to be kafirs, people who are knowingly and deliberately rejecting the truth from God. And therefore, uh, they are promised consequences which are going to be very serious in the next life. And as I said, if those prophets are Rasul as well, in their, in their case, they're going to be punished in this life as well. So the consequences are really serious, provided the one who does not accept the message of uh, the prophets is actually committing kufr. But what does that mean? And what it means is that it is possible that sometimes some people may not be able to understand the message properly. It may not have been delivered to them properly. And therefore, if they are not accepting it, they are not actually rejecting the message of God. Because the message of God, in order for it to be acceptable to humans in a way that if they don't accept it, they're going to be regarded as uh, as uh, criminals in the eyes of the Almighty. It has to become absolutely clear uh, without any shadow of doubt. And that is something that can only happen when the Prophet is present physically himself. As regards the rest of the mankind, we don't know. We can never be sure. The message has to be delivered. It has to be communicated to all people. But whether a person who is not believing or not accepting the message is actually somebody who is to be condemned because he is a kafir, uh, no clear, confident statement can be made in their regard. Uh, I'll, I'll try to clarify it a little, little more. It's a, it's a kind of a complex matter. And I hope that your so questions later would hopefully clar clarify it still further. Uh, we have two verses which are quite often referred to by people uh, regarding whether accepting prophets is an abs absolutely essential requirement for the salvation of an individual. Uh, the verses are verses 62 of Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 62 and verse 69 of Surah Al-Maidah. In both verses, what is happening is that the Almighty is apparently saying that whether you are a Muslim, or a Jew, or a Christian, or a Sabian. If you believe in God and the life hereafter, and do good deeds, you will succeed. You will be eligible for the paradise. And uh, the question that obviously arises is that uh, if that is the case, then is this these are these verses saying that believing in prophets is not absolutely necessary? Well, the answer to this question is that these two verses are clarifying that belief in God and the life hereafter and good deeds are the expectations of the Almighty that are universal. They apply to all humans, no matter wherever they are. Uh, depending upon their circumstances, obviously the question is going to uh, be relevant to them only to the extent that their ability to understand would enable them to reach the conclusions, reach the understanding that was uh, expected from them. So in other words, what I'm saying is that it all depends on your capacity. If your capacity is such that you could understand the message more fully, the expectation from you is greater. But if your capacity is such that you had your limitations, whether limit, limitations of your personality or the limitations of your circumstances, then the expectations are going to be lower. God is the best judge. He is the only one who will be able to decide on the basis of pure merit. However, when a message coming from a messenger of God or a prophet of God becomes absolutely clear to an individual or a nation, then believing in them becomes a necessary 
consequence of believing in God because they are God's representatives. So it's not possible for a person to believe in God and not believe in his prophets. But obviously, it all depends on whether the message of the prophet has reached the person or the group of people properly or not. As I said earlier, who is going to decide? The Almighty. It's only he who knows whether the message has reached certain people as properly and convincingly as would require them to accept and acknowledge under all circumstances without any excuses. So, you know, the answer to this question would vary from individual to individual, from society to society, from era to era. If it sounds confusing, well, that's how it is. This is something which really needs to be understood and we must talk about it more and more. I am saying what I believe is very clearly mentioned in the Quran. Unfortunately, what has happened is that there are many religious people who have decided that there are only two categories. Either you are a believer or you are a disbeliever. You are a kafir. The fact of the matter is that believers are the ones who believe and acknowledge the message of the Almighty. The disbelievers, the kuffar, are the ones who reject the message of the Almighty coming through to them through the messengers, even when the message becomes absolutely clear. But there is a third category of people who are going to be judged in accordance with what, what, whatever was reasonably uh, expected from them. So, uh, you know, the message of the Almighty, as it has come down to us through prophets, has to be delivered to others. Now, this there might be this question that, that, that would arise. Why should then the message be delivered to people when it is possible for an individual to succeed in the next life and get salvation even without accepting the message of the Almighty that has come through the prophets? Why should we communicate the message? Well, the answer is that we will communicate the message of God to others. I will communicate it to others because I believe it to be from God. And my understanding and conviction is that it is quite as much applicable to me as it's applicable to him as it is applicable to me. So I must introduce this message to everybody else as much as is possible, as much as people would allow me to deliver, deliver it to them. Uh, however, even if um, they do not accept what I'm saying. I will not say that they are damned, that they are rejected by the Almighty. Why? Because I'm not a prophet. I'm a very ordinary person. My ability to communicate is limited. My personality is not impressive. It's only the prophets who are the ones who are chosen by the Almighty, who when they come, the Quran says, they become the criterion the ultimate criterion that sifts, distinguishes right from wrong. They are the light. They are the guide. They are the ultimate truth. And somebody who come across them is somebody who is able to meet them, learn about them directly, uh, has no possibility of not accepting and acknowledging them, would recognize them. And that is why uh, it, it's different in case of uh, people who uh, get the privilege of being contemporaries of, of prophets. So we must deliver the message because it is our understanding that the message is from God and, and, and therefore it needs to be shared with others. And uh, another reason why uh, one should always deliver the message to others if there is a possibility is that the Quran makes it clear that all good humans, all good humans, they deserve to know God's message, to understand it and to follow it. Because the message of the Almighty, if it is understood and followed, it enables you to come close to 
to your creator, to understand his scheme, his plan for this world, for this life. And uh, obviously, I mean, to live a life without understanding what the Almighty's grand plan is, uh, is to live in darkness, to live in confusion, to live without the kind of guidance that is needed by all humans. Because this life, as I keep saying, is a puzzle, and this puzzle needs to be solved. And it cannot be solved except through the understanding that is given to us uh, by the prophets coming to them from the Almighty. So, the question that, co that comes to one's mind is that why would an individual who is not a born believer, why should he believe? Now, honestly, the question arises regarding those who are born believers as well. Because when you are a born Muslim, for example, you believe primarily because you have been informed by your environment, your society, your parents, your elders. You've not yourself uh, understood the message as yet properly. You've not internalized it. And therefore, you need to be convinced. You need to feel strong about it, confident about it. So why should anyone believe? And does the Quran tell us that believing should be should should be a, an experience which would entail reasoning, logical understanding? Well, the answer I, I, I've been talking about it all along. The Quran mentions it over and over again that it is only through reasoning use of intellect that we reach the understanding of belief. So, the Quranic understanding uh, has to be appreciated. We ought to know what are the arguments that lead uh, an individual to believe that the message of the prophets is the message of God. The fact of the matter is that there were many prophets who came to this world but the Quran claims that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was the last prophet. And therefore, the message he brought was the last message of God. And it was, as a result of the, this decision of the Almighty, it was fully preserved. Now, if we accept this claim of the Quran and we believe in the last prophet, we thereby, as a consequence, believe in all earlier prophets. So, after the last prophet, uh, believing in prophets actually boils down to only one question. And that is, was the message delivered by the last prophet, is it from God? If somebody acknowledges it, then he acknowledges as a consequence of, of that decision all earlier messages and prophets. Now, what exactly does the Quran tell us to uh, feel strong and be and, and convinced about this claim that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was the Prophet, the Messenger of God. If you read the Quran, you would find, find from A to Z, the Quran is trying to convince you as a reader that this book is God's book. And therefore, the one who has brought it is God's Messenger, his Prophet. Uh, but if you if you look at the arguments that are presented, uh, my understanding is that the arguments can be understood under four different titles. There are four different categories of arguments. The first category is the uh, argument of the personality of the prophet. The second category of arguments is the argument of understanding the Quran and seeing for ourselves that it is God's text. It's his message. The third argument, the category of argument that is presented is that the last prophet came as a consequence of prophecies that were there about his arrival. His arrivals was, arrival was foretold. He didn't come, you know, 
all of a sudden without being expected by others. So there was a clear mention about his arrival in the earlier books. And <clears throat> the last argument that you find in the Quran is that within his lifetime, the Prophet Wasallam, he mentioned that there's something important that's going to happen. And what he mentioned actually happened. Even though when he began to making that claim, to begin with, it seemed very, very unlikely, improbable. And yet, within a span of 20 years or so, it actually became a, re a reality. So these four arguments, categories of arguments, are what you find mentioned in the Quran over and over again. So when you read the Quran, any passage of the Quran, you would find that the Quran is convincing you that the book that you're reading is the book of your creator. And you would find that this assertion is made on the basis of arguments. It's trying to convince you, trying to convince your intellect, trying to make put across arguments that would make you feel comfortable that this claim is correct. So, I will today mention the first point and then the later sessions we'll talk about the other arguments. So the first claim, the first argument of the claim that the Quran makes is uh, regarding the fact that the Prophet was God's prophet, God's messenger, is the argument of his personality. The Quran mentions in a verse, verse number 16 of Surah Yunus, Surah number 10. A prophet tells them, Faqad umram min abli. I have lived with you before this, before receiving the message of God, for a life, a lifetime, for a long duration. Afala taqilun. Don't you understand? Don't you use your intellect? So in other words, the Prophet is telling his contemporaries, people of Makkah and surroundings, that you know me well. And I'm telling you that I'm the Prophet of God. How can you deny it? How can you say no to it? So this argument is actually the argument of the personality of the Prophet. Now, the personality of the Prophet has been presented in various different ways. One important mention in the Quran is the, uh, the character of the Prophet. You see, the Prophet lived in, in, a, in a society, in a city which had a very small population. It was a city, city of Mecca, where everybody knew everybody else. You know, I mean, uh, you could not be uh, living in a way that others would not know about you. So, when you're living in such a society, people know your good aspects of your personality, your weaknesses, your problems, limitations, your background, everything. Uh, the Quran mentions that when this message was presented to the people of Mecca, this was one of the earliest uh, points that, that was raised. Uh, we know from history, we, we know from the mention of the Quran as well, that the Prophet ﷺ was all along throughout his life uh, was known as a reliable person, a trustworthy person, a sadiq al uh, Somebody who through his conduct showed to the people around him that he, is, uh, he has a personality which is impeccable. Uh, people relied upon him. They were sure that whatever he would say would be true. He would never tell a lie. So this, this aspect of his personality enabled him to very confidently claim at the earlier part of his prophetic mission 
to stand before the people and say to them that, look here, if I make a claim that there is an army of the enemy which is just about prepared to attack you, would you believe? And this, he, this claim he made uh, on, on the Mount of Safa, you know, he drew the at attention of the people over there uh, to ask this question. And this he did because it, there was a tradition amongst the people of Mecca that if there was a, an important uh, piece of information that was to be shared with others, particularly if there was an in, you know, impending calamity, uh, some threat from the outside world that was to be conveyed to the people, that was the normal way of doing it. So when the people gathered around him and he said that if I were to make that claim, would you believe it? And everybody said that we know nothing except always uh, the truth coming from you. So if you make a claim that the enemy is, you know, is, is, is prepared to attack us, I, we accept what you're saying. And, and then he made this claim that I received the message of the Almighty. And uh, the message tells you not to worship the false gods that you are worshipping and that there's going to be another line and so on. And when they heard that the prophet was telling them about something that was different from the beliefs of their elders, forefathers, uh, was going against the traditions of their society, it was then that they opposed him. So that is what made his claim so very strong and important. That he was a man of such strong character that a statement coming from him could not be could not be rejected, could not be ignored. Um, he was so reliable and so very surprising that the people who turned his enemy, they were his enemies because of uh, because of their attachment to their the, the faith of their elders, that they went against him and his companions and made their lives, lives so very difficult that they were then forced to decide that they're going to migrate to another place, to Medina, to Yasrib. Uh, and yet, before leaving the city, he had valuables belonging to his enemies who, who found no other person except the Prophet to be entrusted with those valuables so that they would feel confident that they're, they're safe, secure. So he had to leave behind his cousin, Ali, and, and he gave those valuables to him to return to their owners. Such was the uh, confidence in the character of the Prophet, of the locals. Um, so that's one point, that the personality of the Prophet was presented and the aspect of the personality was that he was a reliable person, extremely reliable, extremely trustworthy. That is why the Quran keeps saying that all prophets who came uh, to their respective nations, they made this statement, Inni lakum rasulun ameen. We are the messengers for you who are ameen, who are reliable, who are trustworthy. If you can rely on us in matters, worldly matters, we are telling you, I am telling you, the Rasul would say that I have received something even more important, more valuable, which is the message of God. And it is my obligation as a person who is reliable to let you know everything that I have received. I cannot deceive you. I have to tell you what is important for you. So that's one argument. This argument, somebody might say, is not directly valid for us because we have not experienced uh, this aspect, part of the personality of the Prophet And one must concede that this, this, you know, would make sense. However, the people who were his contemporaries, they had no excuse. They knew through their experience, that the man that they're dealing with is somebody who is so very reliable that to just to, to, to make a claim that what he's saying is wrong, 
is would 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 not really be uh, acceptable. Their conscience would not accept it. Another aspect of his personality that is mentioned in the Quran is that the people who were living with him in the society they knew that he was unlettered. He did not know how to read. He did not know how to write. I mean, there were a few people who had this, the training of reading and writing. Not everybody knew how to read and write. And the Prophet ﷺ did not know how to read or write. So he had no training of, of learning. Formal education was not something that he went through. And yet, when he attained the age of 40, he started delivering the message of the Almighty so deep in its wisdom, so rich in its presentation, um, so convincing that, uh, I mean, people were amazed. And obviously one had to, to come up with some kind of explanation if one was not to believe that it's from God. Where else did it come from? The man who is presenting it, we know that he had no training of reading, writing, learning from anywhere. So that in itself is uh, presented uh, by the Quran as an argument. And uh, therefore, you know, when the Quran says that this book, the Quran, is a clear evidence of the fact that Prophet, the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of God. The Quran says, Yasin, this is Surah Yasin, Wal Quran al Hakim. The wise Quran is an evidence in Nagala Min al Mursali that, O oh Prophet, you are amongst the messengers. That is, you read the Quran, you read the wise Quran, you read what it is saying, its amazing teachings, and then you come to the conclusion that this man is God's messenger. Where else did he get this, these jewels of wisdom from? So that's the second argument that. Quite apart from his impeccable character, uh, he was somebody people knew who never went through formal education. So therefore, there was no source of learning from him for him uh, that could be explained as the reason why he's coming up with such gems of, uh, of wisdom. The third aspect that the Quran alludes to regarding the personality of the Prophet is that in the first 40 years of his life, he was never, ever interested in matters that had to do with the unseen world. You know, there were people who were there in the Arabian society called the Kahins, soothsayers, who used to talk to people about the unseen world. They had contacts with jinns. They used to make loud claims. They would try to impress people. But this man they knew was so down to earth that he would never ever make any statement that would give you an indication that he wants to prove that he is a person superior to others. Never ever. And he, was no, he had no interest in talking about the matters that belong to the unseen world. Because he never had any experience. And he was never interested. And that is another interesting aspect of all prophets, particularly we find in the Quran about Musa as well. But he was not interested. He was not looking for becoming a prophet. It was a responsibility given to him as well as the last prophet uh, without them ever expecting it. In fact, to begin with, they were nervous. They were reluctant. They never wanted to have it because it was a huge responsibility. So that in itself was a very important reason for the locals of for the society to, to know that this man is, is absolutely right. I mean, how can anyone in his senses claim that he's telling a lie, he's, he's deceiving others? There was no chance. There was no chance. As I said, people of later times may have reasons to, to talk about it, to doubt and to, to discuss, you know, the possibility that probably it was not right. And there are other arguments to convince them. But for the people who were his contemporaries, it was absolutely clear. And therefore, 
If they did not believe, they actually rejected the truth that they had seen with their own eyes. And there is another interesting aspect of uh, the Prophet's personality that you see through the Quran. When you read the Quran and you imagine that the Quran was revealed to the Prophet. You know what is what the Quran is? You read the Quran and you find that the Quran is actually all along a communication between the Almighty, the Creator and His Prophet. A communication which uh, guides him which gives him advice, uh, comforts him, uh, lets him know what the message of the Almighty is for him to accept and absorb, and, and it has to be communicated to others. Contrary to the understanding of many people who think that the Prophet ﷺ was given guidance in each and every aspect of his life. That's not true. That's not true. The Prophet was given guidance through Wahi, which became ultimately the text of the Quran. Indeed, he was guided through Wahi in certain other matters, which never found a place in the Quran. However, he was given independence. He followed the guidance of the Almighty that he received in the form of principles and he did what we might call his own ishtihad. He actually led a life even after receiving wahi from the Almighty independently in, in all earnestness as an honest person who was sincere and dedicated to the cause of the Almighty and his message. He would receive Messages all along, every now and then, guiding him to do what the Almighty expected from him. But that doesn't really mean that every moment of his life was based on the direct revelation of the Almighty. What I'm trying to say is that a good part of the decisions taken by the Prophet ﷺ, statements made by him, were his own independent decisions. I mean, he was the best of the humans. God had confidence in him, on, in him. So he did not need to tell him in every step of his life that, look here, now you make this statement. Use this word. Go there. No. I mean, that, that would really seem very strange. That, that didn't happen. What happened was that he was guided and the guidance, guidance was basic in important matters. He was... Uh, informed that this is what he's supposed to do. At this point in time, you've got to be patient. Don't respond to them and so on. But in many cases, I think in most cases, he decided on his own. Now, what I'm trying to say is that on the one hand, there is this interaction of the Almighty with the Prophet through the Quran. And as I said, in some way, in, in some part outside the Quran as well. But the Prophet was taking his own decisions for the same purpose. And in most cases, those decisions were absolutely spot on. The fact that the Almighty did not intervene in itself was a confirmation of the fact that what he decided, what he said was right. However, not always. There are some instances when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, despite his uh, undisputed sincerity, took certain decisions which were contrary to what the Almighty wanted him to do. And they were corrected in the Quran. Now this aspect of the Quranic guidance to the Prophet and his personality is amazing. You know, and this somebody who is reading the Quran properly would find it, you know, a very strong reason for him to feel confident that the Quran is God's word and it is guiding humankind. It is, it is guiding the Prophet as well. Uh, there are several passages, <clears throat> but I'll just mention three of them. In one passage, uh, Surah Tawbah, verse 
43. You see, Surah Tawbah, the ninth Surah of the Quran, is the Surah, probably the final Surah as far as the prophetic mission is concerned. It is the only Surah that does not begin with Tasmiyah, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. The reason is that this is the Surah of punishment. It just starts by describing the punishment that the Almighty would send upon the people who rejected the message of the Almighty. So, the punishment that was to be given to the people uh, was given to three different types of disbelievers. Those who were polytheists, al mushrikun those who were the people of the book, Jews and the Christians, and those who were hypocrites. The first 28 verses of the surah, they talk about the punishment of the polytheists. The next four or five verses talk about the punishment meted out to the people of the book. The rest of the surah, pretty long surah, probably 125, 130 verses, they are talking about the hypocrites. Because the hypocrites were the kind of disbelievers who were more complicated than the other two. Because they were a part of the Muslim community. They apparently claimed that they were Muslims. Now, the Almighty followed a policy wherein he <clears throat> caused the hypocrites to get exposed. The difficulty was that alongside the hypocrites, there were some other believers who were believers, but weak believers. And it wasn't easy to distinguish between the two. The hypocrites and the weak believers were behaving somewhat similarly in many ways. And yet the Almighty was determined that he is going to distinguish the believers from the hypocrites. One of the ways he decided to do so was that he declared through his prophet that all able-bodied Muslim men who had the means to, to travel, means of transportation, they must go along with the prophet to a distant place called the book in ex the extreme heat of summers when the crop of dates was ripe, was about to be harvested. So it was a very difficult challenge that could only have been met by the believers. Somebody who had belief in his heart that this instruction is coming from our creator through his prophet. Only he could dare to take 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 uh, the decision to to you know embark upon that journey. Uh, so, at that point in time, the hypocrites obviously didn't go. They couldn't go. Why would they go? I mean, why would they take upon the task of going on a journey which would be extremely difficult and would deprive them of uh, you know, the, the, the blessings of the harvest of uh, the dates that was just about around the corner? So what happened was that these hypocrites, some of them, they came to the prophet with some excuses. You know, it's difficult. We have certain problems. You know, I'm not well and so on. Excuses. And the prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the way he was, kind, merciful, sympathetic, not doubting the intentions of others, permitted them to stay back. And in came this verse. Afallahu anka. O Prophet, may Allah forgive you. Why did you permit them? You see, so there is this mission going on. A very important purpose is about to be served. The hypocrites are to be exposed. It's the Almighty's intent. And yet the Prophet was given the freedom to do it on his own, in, his own, in his own way. Uh, and there was this, this, call it difference of opinion or whatever, the Almighty then corrected him. Look here, you should not have permitted them. Now this, 
difference and the correction of the decision that was taken by the Prophet, you know, when you read it in the Quran, you had a feeling of confidence that this is God's word and it is guiding even the Prophet, you know. Uh, the second, the second uh, passage that you find in the Quran is the 66th Surah, Surah Tehri, wherein the Prophet وسلم, uh, decided in order to, to please some of his wives that he's not going to consume some edible. Uh, it said that probably it was honey, but the Quran doesn't mention it. Uh, and the Almighty said, why are you doing it? Why are you making something forbidden for yourself which Allah has made lawful for you? To, to please your wives. So, you know, again, he's corrected. So what I'm trying to say is, that you see, had it been his own word, his own text, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have find, found these passages in the Quran. And a third very effective passage is uh, Surah 80, Abasa. In the first 10 verses, uh, what we find is, if you understand those verses, the context, that the Prophet وسلم, towards the very early part of his prophetic mission is trying to uh, deliver the message to the chiefs of Quraysh. And in came a blind man, a very devoted believer, but he didn't know what was happening. So, you know, I, I can tell you as a very, very ordinary teacher that if you are saying something seriously, and there are some distractions. You really feel disturbed. Particularly when you are very concerned about what you're doing. You're know, very serious in what you're doing. You're trying to deliver the message. Convince others. So the prophet was doing this task. And in came this blind man. And, and I'm sure that he was also distracted because of the fact that he realized that these people are going to make fun of him. And that too was something that was in his mind. And there were expressions on his face from uh, because of him coming in. And the Almighty corrected. And he frowned and, uh, simply because there came this blind man to him. How did you know, a Prophet, that he might he might purify, correct himself? And he might have listened to you and uh, this uh, this process would have helped him. As for those who are not taking you seriously, you are devoting more time and energy towards them. Even though it's not your responsibility if they don't re reform themselves. Brilliant. I mean, what you find is and there's simultaneously this process going on, the prophet taking decisions on his own as a human being, the best of the humans. And yet, he was a human. He took, took his decisions. But on the other hand, it is the creator who is guiding him through the Quran and telling him that, look, at, no, no, don't do that. This is not what I expect from you. So, what I'm saying is that when you read the Quran, you find that the prophet's personality, the way it was and the way it has been presented in the Quran and you understand the verses of the Quran and you look at his personality, you get a very strong feeling that this could not have been the case had he not been genuinely the prophet of God. So as I said, this was the first of the arguments. Uh, there are four arguments. We'll talk about the other four, the other three in the next sessions. Abu Lukwali Hada wa Staghfirullah wa Barakatuh.